Hello everyone, my name is Nathaniel Holmes and I'm going to be your SI leader for Math 9A this quarter. In this video, I'm going to be going over what SI is all about and what the weekly schedule is going to be for this. So, some quick info about SI. Supplement, uh, supplemental instruction or SI is a service run by the Academic Resource Center. It's meant to be an additional resource for students to turn to in historically challenging courses. It's meant to be a safe space for students to receive additional practice or help uh, whenever they feel they need it. So the way SI is going to be working is going to be super different from, it has, from how it has been in previous quarters. So this is what our weekly schedule is going to be looking like. Twice every week, I'll be uploading a video to this YouTube channel, uh, and we're going to be reviewing major topics that we cover during lecture. Each of these videos is going to have a short worksheet based on the topics I go over. They're not going to be exactly the same, but they're going to be the same kind of idea. Uploads will typically be Wednesday and Friday mornings. If not then, then earlier, like Tuesday or Thursday night. I'm going to try to get an, on a strict schedule, but I'm not entirely sure how everything's going to be working this quarter. Also twice a week, I'll be holding office hours on Zoom. So there I can answer any questions you have about the worksheet. We'll probably go over the solutions in there, or you can ask me anything about the course that you want. So the Zoom codes down below, as well as the Zoom link. And the times are gonna be Wednesday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. and Friday, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. If these times don't work for you, I can try to move them if a lot of people need me to, or you can try to get in contact with me over email, and I'll try to help you out uh, there. So let's just get started with a little bit of review. So the first thing that I think you should remember is different uh, fundamental functions and how to sketch them. So these are some of the main ones that you should know for this class. So polynomials are gonna include x, x squared, x cubed, or even constant numbers like y equals one, that's gonna be also a polynomial. So this would be graph of x, x squared, and x cubed here. The next one that you would need to know are trigonometric functions. So these are gonna be like cosine x here and sine x over here. You try to indicate some of the points that aren't as clear so you get the picture of where everything is on these kinds of graphs. It would also probably be useful to know about tangent x plus all the inverses of cosine, sine, and tangent, knowing all of those different functions, but I think cosine x and sine x are gonna be the most important ones for you to remember. Next up are exponential function. So this would be anything like two to the x or e to the x or any constant to the x really. Um, and they're all gonna look pretty much like these two here. They're gonna be different. They're gonna have different uh, rates of growth, but in general, they're gonna have this form every time. Lastly, uh, something that Professor Wong didn't go over in lecture, but I think is probably going to be helpful later on is going to be natural log of x. Just remember the basic shape for natural log of x, remember some of its properties, and remember that natural log of x is the inverse of e to the x. So what that means is if we have a composition, which we're going to be going over pretty soon, if we have something like e to the natural log of x, we have that the exponent e and natural log cancel out and we're just left with x. Same in reverse, so if you have natural log of e to the x, we're just gonna have x left over. Moving on, like I said, here's algebra of functions, the main three, are gonna be sum, product, and composition. Obviously, if you wanna worry about the subtraction of functions, it's just gonna be the sum of maybe f of x plus minus g of x, right? Same with product, except g of x would be like one over gx. So it, it means pretty much the same thing. So here's a couple examples of each of them. So let f of x equal x squared plus one and g of x equal e to the x. So if we wanna write down the sum of these, we have f of x plus g of x is equal to x squared plus one in parentheses. So this is our f of x component and we're adding that with e to the x, which is our g of x component, right? So next we just have f of x times g of x, the same idea. We have this f of x component, x squared plus one, 
times the g of x component e to the x. Uh, I like to draw these parentheses around each of them so you can remember which corresponds with which. And this is going to be really important, as you can see, for multiplication, where the e to the x needs to be distributed to both the 1 and the x squared. So keep that in mind. Next, we have composition. If you have it in this order, f of g of x. So what does this mean exactly? So if we want to solve this, then we can just have the g of x essentially replace x in f of x. So here, we see that this whole thing is of the general form x squared plus 1, right? But instead of the x, we have e to the x inside. And then we can just simplify here. We get e to the 2x plus 1. So what about g of f of x? I'll give you a second. You can pause it, see if you can figure it out. So the g of f of x is going to be the same thing, but in reverse, right? So we have e to the x. Well, e to the something. It's the same general form here. Rather, instead of the x, we're going to have f of x, so x squared plus 1. So moving on, we have the secant line. This is going to be important really soon, actually. So this is the line between any two points. We can find the slope of the secant line on a function using the following equation. m equals f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. And here a and b are just going to be any two x values we choose. Um, you may have noticed or seen somewhere else that this is going to be the same equation as just finding the slope of a line, right? So this is like your y2 minus y1 over your x2 minus x1. The same thing, pretty much. So let's look at an example of this. So on the right, I have this function here in blue. This is our x squared. If you want to find the slope of the secant line we can, uh, between x equals 0 and x equals 2, then we can just use our equation. So we have m equals f of 2 minus f of 0 over 2 minus 0. So we're looking at this point here and this point here. So we get that this is 4 minus 0 over 2 minus 0, which is just the same as 2. So what does this tell us? This means that the secant line is a line of slope 2, and it's going to be running between the points 0, 0, and 2, 4. And this is going to be what we see here in red. OK, moving on to more so in this class instead of review. Uh, now we're going to be talking about limits. So this is a definition from the notes, or from Professor Wong's lecture slides. I think this is a pretty good definition because I think limits are kind of hard to define in words. It's kind of, at least to me, it comes more intuitively. So f of x is a function. If f of x tends to L as x approaches c, then we say that the limit of f of x when x approaches c is L, denoted by this notation. So what does this mean? So basically, if you want to find the limits, at least my strategy for finding it would be we want to look at where the graph looks. We want to look immediately to the left of the point C and immediately to the right of point C, not necessarily the actual value of f of C. We can pretty much ignore that for the most part because it might just throw us off. If it looks like the graph is approaching the same value from the left and from the right, then the limit exists and equals that expected value. Um, if, we have, if the left and the right are saying two different things, they're not quite lining up, then we would say that the limit does not exist. So let's look at an example. f of x equals x is the function we have here. And let's try to evaluate the following. We have the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. So we see here that the value of f of 1 is just going to be 1, right? But we don't really care about that. We want to look immediately right here to the left and immediately to the right. So I like using like a cursor or something showing movement along the line. So if we're coming this way to the left towards 1, x equals 1, we want to see what we're approaching. So here, if we're coming this way, we're, we're approaching 1. We're about to reach it, but we're not going to look at the actual value there. Let's look from the right now. So if we're coming this way, 
we're approaching x equals 1. And it looks like we're going to be hitting y equals 1, right? So we can say that this limit is 1. So here the limit is going to be the same as the value f of 1. Now looking at this example, we still have the basic idea of f of x equals x here, except this time we have a hole here. So this is how we would notate somewhere that uh, our function is no longer continuous. So this is like the function f of x equals x, where x cannot be equal to 1. So the same thing uh, applies here. So coming in from the left, we look like we're going to y equals 1. And if coming in from the right, we also look like we're going to y equals 1. So we can say that the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x here is still 1. But we see here, because we have a whole, f of 1 does not exist. We can't really define that here. So this is a situation where the limit and the actual value are going to be different. A similar example here is we have the same f of x where x cannot be equal to 0 here. But this time, instead of cannot be equal to 0, we have if x is equal to 0, then we just have f of x equals 1. So again, we're coming in from the left. And it looks like we're about to approach 1 here. Coming in from the right, looks like we're about to approach 1 still. But the actual value f of 1 is down here at 0, right? Does that matter? No, right? So if immediately to the left and immediately to the right, it looks like we're at 1. So our limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is still 1. But f of 1 now equals to 0. OK? And we have one more example, I think. So this time, we have a piecewise where we have f of x equals x all the way up until 1 here. And then when x is 1 or greater, then we have this function. If we follow this line, we can see that this is f of x equals x minus 1, right? So let's do our same method of approaching from the left. So we're coming up. We're coming up this way. And here, it looks like we're about to hit y equals 1. Let's look at the right. We're coming this way. But here, it looks like we're approaching 0, right? So these two don't match. This one is approaching 1 from the left. And from the right, we're approaching 0. So because each side isn't the same, there's no limit here. The limit can't exist. Uh, but here, the, the actual value is f of 1 is equal to 0. But the limit does not exist. So another situation where our limit and our value aren't lining up. If you have any questions about that, um, feel free to leave a comment or email me. My email should be down below in the comment or in the uh, description. Sorry. You can also come to office hours. Either of the times is fine. And I will be going over anything you want me to. And make sure you take a look at the worksheet down below and you understand everything in it. And I can go ahead and go over answers from that or just help you out if you think you need any assistance. So, all right, I think that's about it. So, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know if uh, there's anything I can improve on this. Uh, feedback is always welcome. Thank you guys, and see you soon.